welcome to this group in the past, and we ask you once again to please welcome Mr. Arthur R. Thompson. Uh, usually I start off my presentations by uh, asking who are new to this issue of free trade. I didn't see the hands earlier. Uh, I'm assuming that some of you are, and some of you may be here for the first time. Uh, that being the case, I ask that uh, when you get mad, don't get mad at the messenger, get mad at the message. <laughs> now, normally I give an hour and 15 minute presentation on this, but we boiled it down to a video of about 16 minutes, which we will show first, and then I'll get up and add a few things to it uh, at the end. Uh, we will not be getting into some of those things that will expose to you the duplicity uh, within the two political parties in this issue. Uh, that's something you can read about in, in my book uh, and other methods uh, later on. At any rate, let's just get started with this and, and uh, we'll be back in a moment. Thank you for coming. Before we get started, we like to ask a few questions. Have you ever bought a product and found it wasn't what was advertised? Sure. Have you ever voted for a politician and didn't get what was promised? Of course, we all have. It's the same with the package called free trade. It is not what is being presented. Let's look at what a couple of the founding fathers said about trade, or in their words, commerce. First, George Washington gave us a warning in his farewell address in 1796. He said, "'Tis our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with a portion of the foreign world." Now, he didn't mean any particular portion. He meant any portion of the foreign world. Thomas Jefferson continued Washington's warning about foreign alliances, but added commerce into the mix. In 1799, he said, quote, commerce with all nations, alliance with none, shall be our motto, unquote. Two years later, he said, quote, I deem the essential principles of our government peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none, unquote. As you can see, Jefferson affirmed the goodness of foreign commerce, but at the same time strongly warned us against entangling alliances. In the beginning, we had foreign entanglements, but eliminated them by 1800, and did not get involved with them again until we joined the United Nations 145 years later. So to summarize what our founders told us about trade and foreign alliances, trade is good, while entangling alliances are bad. And, as a brief review, recall that the purpose of the United States government can be boiled down to, one, maintaining our national independence. What was the first document that we studied in school about our American system? It was the Declaration of Independence. It sets down the basic philosophy for our Constitution and our system of government. Independence is the most important responsibility of our government. Without independence, we cannot maintain our Constitution or our Bill of Rights, let alone make our own decisions as a people. Rarely, if ever, do neoconservatives and those who advocate free trade ever discuss our independence and the need to maintain it. The next purpose of government is to protect our God-given rights, which include life, liberty, and property. On the other hand, government was not established to regulate business form permanent alliances, or abrogate the Constitution. Yet these things are done on an almost daily basis, especially with executive orders. The Constitution granted Congress the exclusive power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states, which means that the Constitution did not grant any power to the president or executive branch to regulate commerce. Let me repeat this last point for emphasis. The Constitution did not grant any power to the president or executive branch to regulate foreign commerce. And Congress meant both houses, not simply the Senate. For a large part of our nation's history, Congress regulated trade with tariffs, a fee charged by government for permitting imports or exports of products. These tariffs were a main source of revenue for the federal government and were also used to protect certain domestic industries. This continued until the 1930s, 
Recently, we have undergone subtle changes in how we implement international commerce, from acts by Congress to agreements that include much more than commerce to partnerships which are including the merger of much of our economy and society, including our police and military. Since 2005, we're hearing more about partnerships. As the slide indicates, partnership normally refers to a legal relationship between two or more persons. When we apply the word partnership to relationships between nations, you can see that the governments of these nations are working together in governing their block of nations no longer independent. The government leaders are using the partnership terminology to the extent that they are planning the economic and political integration of the nations involved in the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. At this point, let's discuss what free trade is. Free trade is defined as international trade that is free of such government interference as import quotas, export subsidies, and protective tariffs. Let's provide a little history of the free trade policy. In 1776, Scottish economist and moral philosopher Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations, which established a new trade policy called free trade. It featured the reduction of tariffs and regulations on trade. Now, we're not criticizing classical free trade policy as established by Adam Smith. However, we do criticize the present-day free trade policy that consists of negotiating complex trade agreements or partnerships between nations that do reduce tariffs, but also include provisions for managed trade as well as many other entanglements. We call this the free trade agenda. Let's move on to an example of how a merger was sold as free trade, that of Europe. It was done a step at a time gradually accelerating into the European Union. Now at first the people were sold on the European coal and steel community in 1952 among six nations. They included France and Germany. The next free trade agreement established the European Economic Community in 1957. Next came the Maastricht Treaty of 1992 which established the European Union. Finally the Lisbon Treaty of 2007 which established an EU constitution. The people of Europe were told they would be able to vote on the constitution. Once the people of France and the Netherlands rejected the constitution in their vote, no other country was allowed to vote again, and the EU constitution was ratified by treaty at Lisbon in 2007. In other words, the people of the member states of the European Union lost the independence of their respective nations without a vote of the people. With the loss of independence came the loss of the ability to determine their own future. Now the European Union has 28 formerly independent nations, which are now known as member states, and adding to that number almost every year. Now these states are virtually under the complete control of the European Commission, the European Parliament, the European Central Bank, and a court of justice of the European Union. Every nation that has been added to the EU has lost its independence without a vote of the people. Not only have they lost their independence to the EU, their very own constitution subordinates every member state to the United Nations. Many different agreements and treaties have been signed since 1951 to build the European Union. There are quite a number of these and each was a salami slice made to look harmless until the European socialists had accomplished their goal of a super state for Europe, the dream of Napoleon, Hitler, and Stalin. Just how were the Europeans deceived? This is what Bernard Connolly, former EU official, had to say about it. Quote, It has now become clear to us that what we thought was a common market is nothing more than a project to create a European federal super state in which our sovereignty, Britain's national identity, would be extinguished. In 2003, Christopher Booker and Richard North published a book called The Great Deception, subtitled The Secret History of the European Union. They called the EU, quote, a slow motion coup d'etat, the most spectacular coup d'etat in history. An even bigger coup d'etat is already being negotiated by the United States and the European Union. 
Let's look again at how our trade policy evolved. First, the Constitution gave Congress power to regulate foreign trade in 1787. Then in the 1930s, Congress started to delegate trade policy authority to the president. And then in the 1970s, Congress began to cede more trade policy authority to the president with fast track authority. What is fast track? Congress gives the president authority to negotiate trade agreements. That requires Congress to vote completed agreements up or down within 60 days with no amendments or filibusters. Fast Track was in effect in 1974 through 1994, and then again in 2002 through 2007. Now Obama wants it back. Fast Track has enabled the free trade agenda to move forward. NAFTA and other free trade agreements have come during the Fast Track years. Now let's look at the progress towards a merger of Canada, Mexico, and the United States into a North American Union. In 1979, presidential candidate Ronald Reagan kicked things off with his announcement of his strong support for a North American Accord, which with hindsight can be seen as the embryonic proposal for a North American Union. In 1989, under President George H.W. Bush, we got the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement, our nation's first free trade agreement. This led to a large trade deficit with Canada, one of the reasons we were told we needed the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, which we got under Bill Clinton in 1994 between Canada, Mexico, and the United States. NAFTA laid the foundation for the Security and Prosperity Partnership in 2005 under President George W. Bush, which quickly took on the nickname North American Union. This was curtailed during Bush's tenure by the intervention of the John Birch Society. Obama has now reinstituted the process under such names as the North American Leaders Summits to disguise what's going on. To sum up what we've just been saying, no matter what the administration, whether it was Republican or Democrat, they have been negotiating treaties, so-called free trade treaties, that have involved us in foreign entanglements. And they range from trying to evolve us from the free trade area of Americas, to the NAFTA agreement, to the uh, Security and Prosperity Partnership, and now into these other partnerships with Europe and the Pacific. Now we have a new partnership our government is working on, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Right now it involves 12 nations in the Pacific Rim. It's going to be a European Union type block for the Asia Pacific region. Ultimately, they want all 21 nations of APEC or the Asia Pacific Economic Corporation to economically and politically integrate our countries. This includes China and Russia. What will that mean to be economically and politically integrated? It will mean the loss of our independence in our economics and our political government. That's literally what it means. In addition, we're involved in the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. That's a free trade agreement between the United States and the European Union. Now we know what free trade means in Europe. It means super state. Free trade was only the verbiage they used to fool the Europeans into forming this huge regional government. It would lead to economic and political integration of the United States and Europe. Now keep in mind, political and economic integration means losing our freedoms, whether it's in Asia or whether it's in Europe. Let me tell you a story about what happened to me in, in Europe when I was over there investigating the ramifications of the fall of the Berlin Wall for the New American Magazine. Part of what we were doing over there, uh, we actually got in the office of the Public Relations Director for the European Community, which was the precursor of the European Union. And he said to me, looked me right in the eye across his desk and said, when we get this all together, meaning the European Union, we're going to be bigger than you geographically and economically. And we're going to drag the United States into this union, kicking and screaming if necessary. And I thought, that's very arrogant. I also thought, why aren't uh, these other newspapers and magazines that come into his office reporting what he's saying? Because if he's saying that to me, he surely must have been saying it to them. 
But what we know is that these organizations, uh, such as the Wall Street Journal and New York Times, etc., are for these free trade agreements. So they wouldn't want to report on what the European socialists really have in mind for us, and that is economic and political integration, something a lot different than free trade. Now, the John Birch Society put a halt to the FTAA, the Free Trade Area of Americas. We also put a halt to the Security and Prosperity Partnership, and we fully intend to put a halt to these partnerships that they are negotiating and trying to uh, put on the American people. One of the tools that we've developed, and we've developed several, is a special edition of the New American Magazine. Now, in this particular issue, you can find all the details that you need about these partnerships that they are trying to impose on us. Also, we have my book, which gets into all the ramifications of foreign entanglements, not just free trade. Here is just a panorama of some of the tools that we've developed and are continuing to develop for you to use to inform people in your community about the problems with free trade. We can stop the free trade agenda with your help. These trade deals threaten our national independence, our freedoms, and our economy. It is incumbent on all of us to do something about it. First, educate yourself and then others with the tools available. Those showing you this presentation have most of them available here and now. Second, provide leadership for groups in your community. You already know more than they do about the subject. It will be up to you to lead them into a better understanding of the problem and its solution. You can get the latest updates by texting the word TRADE to the number 88588 on your cell phone. Or you can go to jbs.org and keep apprised of all the latest information, activities, updates, suggestions on the page Choose Freedom, Stop the Free Trade Agenda. And this will inform you how you can help defeat the free trade agenda. Thank you. Yeah, okay, this is it. When we talk about free trade, we think of, of um, you know, people getting together and, and uh, simply sending, sending a widget this way and a gadget that way. And that's really not what free trade is all about. Here, and this is in my book, by the way, uh, you'll find this. Uh, there are certain requirements for equitable free trade. Uh, it's a big difference between the de definition of free trade today and what equitable really means. Now, Dr. Lewis Lloyd was a, uh, a very strong advocate of free trade. And then suddenly one day he woke up and he'd had a paradigm shift and said to himself, wait a minute, we've got to have equitable free trade in order for it to be what we think of as free trade. And he laid down eight things that were necessary to understand about free trade if it was going to be really free in the sense of a libertarian. He said, first of all, taxes must be comparable between the two countries. If you've got a high tax country and a low tax country, who wins on the trade, you see? The same way with a monetary system. A single monetary system must be in use. Now, there is a single monetary system in use in the world. Can anybody tell me what it is? What? I've heard dollar. I've heard gold. Anybody else? It's paper, ladies and gentlemen. That is the monetary system in use. Doesn't matter what you call it. Doesn't matter how it's printed. Doesn't matter how it's backed up. It's paper. And everybody does it. Now, if you have a treaty, a trade treaty, based on the rate of exchange between the currencies at any given moment, if one country ratchets it up the speed on its printing presses, what happens to that rate of exchange? It skews the whole trade process. Or conversely, if they slow down the printing press and go into a period of def deflation. So you need a comparable monetary system. There must be uniform business laws. If you have a country that has OSHA, the EPA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, 
And a country that has none of these things, it doesn't matter whether they besmog their cities or, or pollute their rivers, guess what a country produces things at a cheaper rate? Guess which one wins? The one that doesn't have all these business laws. The same way with ethics. Similar business ethics must prevail. We have a law in this country that says that you can't bribe anybody for a business deal, whether it's inside the United States or internationally. You can get fined and go to jail for that. And yet there are countries that, that where you do business, you have to bribe them. Uh, anybody spell Mexico? Uh, and even China is that way. There are bribes involved in these things. Uh, so you've got to have the same business ethics. Uh, likewise, you have to have uniform wage rates. If I pay a guy $15 an hour to turn a screw in this country and 50 cents an hour to turn a screw in that country, guess who wins? So you have to have uniform wage rates. Uh, maximum labor mobility across borders also needs to be in effect because things change and you've got to have that free flow of labor to make things work out. Freedom from the threat of war. War always will destroy trade agreements and um, often it will destroy economies. And number eight, all of the above would have to be enforced by a world government in order to make it really equitable across the board. In other words, you would have to establish an international governing force, a world government, the United Nations, the European Union or whatever. And that last point, number eight, is why this man believed in free trade. A month before he published the Communist Manifesto, uh, Karl Marx came out uh, for free trade because he says it breaks up old nationalities. And he said, it, in a word, the free trade system hastens social revolutions. Uh, these trade agreements and everything else are not simply trading goods. Being very, very liberal, these agreements are about 20% trade and 80% integration of, of government and uh, regulations and military and environmental laws and all the rest of it. And that's a real danger. For instance, the uh, NAFTA agreement had over 2,000 pages. Are you telling me that you need 2,000 pages to allow a Mexican to bring a watermelon into the United States and an American to put a widget into Mexico? I don't think so. There's a lot more involved, ladies and gentlemen, and those things that are involved are killing us. One of the things that people did not realize was that um, they, uh, there was a uh, court established through NAFTA that now makes decisions relative to trade. One of the things that they had an edict on was that it was unfair trade practices not to allow Mexican trucks on the highways of the United States to compete with our truckers and our trucking companies. Well, it caused such a furor, particularly from the Teamsters Union, that they didn't enforce it. But it's still on the books, ready to be implemented at any time it's politically expedient in the future. That sort of thing goes on. A recent article, for instance, out of the Oklahoma uh, uh, Bar Journal pointed out that these trade agreements have something else hidden in them, and that is that lawyers from other countries can come into the United States and practice law, and they don't have to be licensed. So that sort of thing is going on in that regard. The duplicity of this thing is really quite astonishing, too, because here's a map of what they have planned in Asia, and it is to be run primarily through China. It includes the United States. Well, in this article out of the Wall Street Journal, it said, all roads lead to China. And they said in the article that the plans for this include an Asia-Pacific free trade deal. And that deal is something that they call uh, the uh, FTAAP. And it is basically a free trade area of the Pacific. Now, what they're doing here, for instance, was a full-page ad uh, purchased by the Chinese in the Wall Street Journal. And in here, they said that uh, China's goal is to counter the growing trend of fragmentation in the region that directly undermines economic integration. Now, let me reread that now and listen to every word. China's goal is to counter the growing trend 
of fragmentation in the region. What is another word when you're talking about nations, when you're talking about fragmentation, what does that mean? It's independence. See, they, this is Chinese writing this stuff, okay? And so they make it sound bad, like fragmentation is a bad thing, but we understand independence to be a good thing. And so what they're doing is starting a propaganda campaign to make it look as though the FAAT, FAAP is a Chinese initiative. And the TPP that we talked about in the video is an American initiative. So there you have the propaganda. The TTP, uh, TPP is good because it's American. The FTAAP is bad because it's Chinese. And yet one of our research men who's here today, uh, uh, Mr. Christian Gomez, found this for me. He said, and this is off an official government, uh, whitehouse.gov, back in 2010. And this was one of the, the, uh, uh, the uh, public, uh, what do you call it, the uh, press, release. press release, thank you, that they had. And, and listen to this. Based on the results of this work, we have agreed that now is the time for APEC to translate FTAP, FTAAP from an aspirational to a more concrete vision. Now, this is the White House saying this. To that end, this is the White House, we instruct the AP, APEC to take concrete steps towards realization of an FTAAP. You see, so they fool us now, four years later, with the idea that the FTAAP is Chinese and the TPP is an American, when actually it's the primary goal of both countries. They're just using it as subterfuge. Another thing that's hidden in these agreements, for instance, uh, here's the Euro out of the European Commission. And this is how the instructions on how they are to implement uh, CETA, which is the uh, uh, Canadian Economic Trade Agreement. And in here, buried within the instructions, it says, they reaffirm their strong attachment to democracy and fundamental rights as laid down in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, I don't know if you've ever read the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but if you go to my book, it has this to say about it. And it says that, uh, let's see if I can find it real quick. Um, at any rate, it says that you have fundamental rights, except as prescribed by law. Now, that's not what the Bill of Rights says, is it? The Bill of Rights says you can't pass a law abrogating any of these rights, freedom of speech, et cetera, et cetera. But according to the United Nations, it's okay. You have all these rights. We grant them to you. We say we get our rights from God, do we not? The United Nations says you get your rights from us. And we can change them by law at any time we wish to. And by the way, there's a whole list in here of those things and also the various treaties that already uh, affect American society. For instance, uh, in here are fundamental rights, banking, economics, monetary policy, trade, industry, education, women, birth control, abortion, population control, private ownership of firearms, oceans and their tributaries, courts that can supersede American courts, labor, agriculture, uh, environment, and tourism are all now controlled out of the UN because they passed treaties and we ratified them that you didn't realize what was in those treaties. And so when you look at that, it becomes very revealing. Now, one last, uh, one last thing that I want to show you about what free trade really means. Now, this is the 2013 financial report of the Export-Import Bank, okay? Now, the Export-Import Bank was started under Franklin Delano Roosevelt during the middle of the Depression to help boost the economy and the industry of, of America, and in other words, the government was going to guarantee loans to foreign governments in order to uh, have these uh, factories back up online. These foreign governments would come in and they'd want a product. They couldn't pay for it. Uh, they're going to take out a loan. They're, uh, they're, where they're going to get the loans, costs, it costs too much interest. So we'll just create a bank for them, the Export-Import Bank, and, and give them an interest rate that even American citizens can't get for American products. So the Export-Import Bank, when you look at it, it's kind of interesting 
because the countries that they extend these loans to, and this is even in 2013, include Russia and China. Do you think the Chinese need to take out a loan from the United States to get American products, really? When they've got all that money from Kmart and Walmart and all the rest of them? I don't think so. But then it gets very interesting because then the report gets into who gets this money. In other words, every one of these blue ticks is Boeing, okay? So a country comes to Boeing and says, we want these aircraft. And so they go to the Export-Import Bank and they get the money and the Export-Import Bank pays Boeing. And then the country is supposed to pay back Export-Import Bank, okay? So Boeing doesn't care, it's got its money, the planes are out the door, everything's great, except for one little thing. And that is we're selling planes to American airline in competition to where they can't buy those planes through these low-cost loans. See, that's bad enough, okay? But you get into this, and it gets real interesting. Here's uh, three on this page. There's about a dozen on this page. And you can see all these blue ticks. In fact, the nickname for the Export-Import Bank is Boeing's Bank. Now, here's where the free trade part comes in. If a country reneges on their loans, like Pakistan did, they get the planes for free. That's the free part. Guess who pays for them? The taxpayer. You see, so there's a lot of things. When you start pulling in these loose ends and put it all, all into a big story, suddenly you realize, one, we're going to lose our sovereignty. Two, it's bad for our economy. And three, it's, it's just going to sink us as, as a country if we keep going ahead blindly into these agreements. And uh, there's a lot more to it. Uh, I usually spend an hour and 15 minutes on it, and I'm just barely scratching the surface when I get done. It's very important that we understand the real seriousness of this. It isn't simply trade. It's also imposing on us environmental regulations. Anybody here not understand Agenda 21? Now, you're going to hear that the unions and uh, the uh, environmental organizations are opposed to these free trade agreements. They are until they force more international controls and they get a better deal on their agenda for labor and the environment. And then they will flip-flop immediately. That's what they've always done. They push and push and push till they get a deal and then they change their mind and say, okay, it's good now, we can, we can endorse it. So a lot of conservatives will see that the environmentalists and the union people are against it, and so they think, oh, well, I should be for it. And so the way they react, uh, a lot of people into it. Every congressman, every senator that we've talked to that are in agreement with these trade uh, deals think that they have something to do with trade. Not one of them have really looked into it. Not one of them. Those who have oppose them. But believe me, I don't know. I cannot even think of a candidate running for president on either side of the ticket that's not in favor of these free trade agreements. Not one. Let's take some questions. Oh, okay. We got about five minutes. Yeah. Uh, well, and it's also true, isn't it, that a lot of Republicans and Republican leadership also is for these free trade agreements? Oh, yeah. Yeah, but you see what happens is how anybody here not know what the Council on Foreign Relations is? Okay. The problem is that this, a lot of these people are all mixed up with the Council on Foreign Relations, either as members or they have people on their staff who are key personnel who are CFR members. And I can say without any hesitation, that includes every underlined, capitalized, emboldened, and italicized, every Republican candidate for president. Let that sink in mull over who these guys all are from A to B to C to D to Z. Every one of them. Um, you mentioned in your presentation the economic and political integration that's going on with these trade agreements. In the past, we've seen in, in Europe and elsewhere that it's been the economic integration that's preceded the political integration. 
Is that what we see happening with America and these free trade agreements, or are they just, or, or not? Well, it is, but it's so far behind the scenes that people don't see it happening. Uh, for instance, they will, they will uh, enforce and, and agree to enforce a, a step at a time. For instance, Obama has signed an agreement allowing, uh, through the, uh, the North American Union, used the nickname, uh, f- f- just last year, to allow uh, Canadian and Mexican troops to come into the United States to help us in a national emergency, whether it's civil or, na- or natural, uh, as declared by Obama. And it'll be the first time that we will have allowed foreign troops on our soil since the War of 1812. And so that's the sort of thing that it's there, uh, it's happened, but you don't see it. And you wouldn't see it until a national emergency occurred where they would have these people come in. Uh, and, but there are other little things like that in the, in the world of in the environment and that sort of thing. I mean, who here believes they can control the environment? No. What you do is you control the people in the name of the environment, don't you? And that's what's going on. All these agreements that they're making, like with Obama and China here recently, have really nothing to do with controlling the environment. It's controlling the people. I just saw a, uh, I, I shouldn't even get into this, but just today I saw a report uh, that these new gasolines they're forcing on us are destroying the engines of automobiles, and you can lose your warranty on your car if you use some of those ethanol gasoline blends that uh, Volkswagen and others have already declared that. You're going to lose your warranty if you use these things. And yet, what do we see in the newspapers? These things are good for us. It's going to cut down the carbon emission uh, emissions in the air and on and on and on. So, uh, in fact, it'll actually eat up your, your, uh, your, uh, um, the system that, that injects uh, gas into your engines. It will actually eat it up. So, uh, if anybody's interested in that, if you want to leave me your email address, I'll be happy to, to forward that to you so that you can actually see for yourself what's being said. And I think uh, we need to have an article on that in the magazine. You know, it's, it's really quite bad. We've got about one more minute. One, one more question? You've had it up longer. Um, I guess two questions might be brief, but give us a little read on Senator Johnson in terms of where, what you've been finding with him on, on this particular issue. And second, maybe more important, is uh, the John Birch Society. Obviously, many of us are members of it. I'm a member of it, but... Um, I don't get a sense of, you know, how you are attacking this problem nationally as an organization. Well, uh, we can't do much until the actual document is in front of us. Uh, we're setting the stage. Uh, we're we're giving it even more uh, in our next bulletin in January. But the, one of the problems we have with this issue is we we can't say see. It's not there yet. It's being done in secret. And if they get free trade authority, we've only got 60 days uh, to say, hey, look, in these thousands of pages, see these things, how bad they are? And, uh, and to convince those that think that the title is all they have to look at. You know, we used to have a wonderful man in Congress who was the chairman of the John Birch Society, Larry McDonald. And he told me how he decided, he said he re- read every bill that came before Congress. He's every one of them. He says, I always stopped when it became unconstitutional and then wrote no on it. He says, sometimes it was the title. (laughs) Sometimes it was the first sentence, but he says it was never longer than the first paragraph. (laughs) No, not at all. So that's how he decided it, you see. And so what we've got to get people to do is to get beyond the title. Now, Senator Johnson's for these things. But I believe in my heart that he can change his mind. Well, he's an honest man, I believe. And if we get to him and sh- demonstrate things to him, there are some of them that will not change their mind. And I, I, was, I spent all day with an with a AA of a U.S. senator. And he said, one, tell you one problem with my man is that once he makes up his mind, you can't change it. He says, sometimes that's a good thing. He says, sometimes it's a bad thing. So, you know, we just have to be friendly, build trust with these people, 
uh, reach out to them as kindly as we can, inundate them with information. And if we all do it together in a coordinated basis, but independently uh, through the bulletin, uh, we'll change a lot of people and stop these things. That's how we've done it before. It's how we'll do it again. Thank you very much. I'll sign my book if anybody wants to, uh, to get one and answer any more questions back there. Thanks a lot.